My game face. Hello and welcome to episode 77 of Taste My Game Face. I'm your host, Izzy Adiemo, joined today by Joe Knight. Hello. And Daniel Slauson. Hello. So, this is, uh, well, in fact, E3 has happened um, before um, you would have heard this episode, but after we record it. So we're not actually going to be able to comment on it. And in point of fact, we want to get a recording out a little bit faster than usual. We do these uh, episodes normally every two weeks, but we're going to record next week from now so we can talk about what does or doesn't happen at E3. So this is going to be a little bit of a shorter episode than usual, but we do have some things that we want to cover in that space and time. So... I think we should get stuck into some questions to start with. And then Dan's been playing a game from the retro corner. Don't get gassed about E3. <laughs> Listen to us talk about old games. It's fucking hell yeah. That's what you <laughs> should be doing anyway. The E3 is for suckers and apparently I am one of those suckers. But you know, like, whatever. <laughs> I'm so, definitely one of those suckers. I, hear that noise. I can't I can't even anymore. I hear I'm that little bit older than you guys though. Like, I, I don't mind camping out on this for a minute. That, that, I have that, a kid I have a kid and I've taken a day off work. Oh dude, man, you're all <laughs> fucked up, bruv. There's no there's no saving you. But there but there are Feed years. Me. There, there are years between us. Years between us. You'll get there, don't, don't you? Worry. Don't don't you mm. remember my E three episode where I just complained about how terrible E three was the whole Still time. fucking dealt with it though, didn't we? That was <laughs> like, Well you just you just want to put it to the side. I would rather I happening. would rather like I, I like I would rather listen to the podcast of you guys talk about E three, except for the fact that it would irritate me greatly because I wouldn't be there to moan all about everything. <laughs> Which is the only reason I turn up now. Like, you know, I'm hoping Wayne will turn up because, you know, he's got that equal part of moaning about every fucking tiny thing that happens. Fucking old. Old and jaded. That's where you are. I'm getting to that point where someone walks out on stage at E3 and I go, I don't like the cut of his jib. <laughs> Turning it off. <laughs> I'm getting to that point. <laughs> I appreciate it. Appreciated Grumpy Wayne on the last podcast. Oh man, he's so good at it as well. <laughs> I am. Um, I, f- I find myself kind of caught between the desire to be irritated with everything and actually thinking that we should attempt to be somewhat positive about things that stand a chance of being good because fuck it man like we've had loads and loads of good video games in like the last little spat and that and as i keep saying it's whatever you want from them like if whether it's that you want the big triple a blockbusters I mean, or like the minor affairs there's a lot of shit in between but there's so many video games that you get good if that's all you want to play uh, can i just do a little to side of a bit of a hot take that i saw on a i think it maybe it was games industry biz this week which was uh, the art director of uh, of God of War saying, God of War 2, or, you know, God of War the next, is going to be way better than the last one. I just have this to say to that man, good fucking luck. I mean, yeah. God bless you. Go go into that middle distance with that in your mind. And I, I, I will I'll love to see that. I can't I can't camp out on that. I have, I have like a complete opinion about this at, in point of fact, now that you've brought it up, because that's the thing that I've been considering. One of the really nice things about like the, the new God of War is that it starts uh, in a more kind of confined and like more low key manner and really slowly builds up the epicness. They cannot do that for a sequel. Like they can't like start things like in a, in a kind of minor more personal scale to begin with anymore like it's it's all gone fucking epic and that's where they have to live now so i i think it will be incredibly hard for them to try and deliver as enjoyable an experience because it won't have that range yeah lightning in a bottle let's hope it's not <laughs> yeah let <laughs> prove us prove us wrong prove us wrong Mm. But hey, we've talked a lot about God of War. Yeah, though. yeah, moving on. <laughs> so let's talk about some other things. There are some questions from some people on our Discord that I kind of like to discuss. Um, so let's have a gander. So a chap by the name of Sneaky Russian, or actually Sneaky.ru, um, asked a question about um, MMOs. Um, so 
he is interested in why um i think this is kind of off the back of the uh slightly piss take question we had or slightly piss take way we answered a question at the end of last episode asking about beat em ups this one is about mmos um this is asking why um world of warcraft style mmos have actually continued to exist like considering the fact that world of warcraft dominates completely dominated that market and that that has like i mean it's sort of died away hasn't it i mean actually i don't know there's probably still a lot of people playing it but nowhere near as many as there were in its peak but i think if you look at you know kind of the dominance if you look at the range of mmos i i feel you have three major players and i know that there are others and i know that there were early runners like your ever quests and stuff like that but like if you look at it i think that there are three big runners and those three runners have a lot of identity unto themselves right so you got you got world of warcraft you got final fantasy yeah those two are really cashing in on a pre-built fan base and then the weird outlier I've always seen is Guild Wars, which decided to kind of uh, streamline the experience and not, and, and not have a subscription. Fee. Yeah, and do and I did think, a really I fucking good job. I'm getting a really important one, um, which is Eve. Oh, I guess, I guess, I, 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 I think I was going so much more into the kind of you know standard man with a stick running around a field oh, no, that's simulators fair. that's fair but when it, whenever i think of mmos these days i end up thinking of eve because i i feel like i feel like um what, what's the what's the name of the studio who like uh ccp or something like that i have no C-C-C- idea but continue cccp i think okay or is that hang on it, that's, know, that's, 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 the, the that's the old ussr, USSR. <laughs> yeah, okay. well, whatever they're called you know? Um, so yeah, like I think they managed to very carefully carve out a niche, which was we have a particular type of game that's for a very particular type of person and we are going to cater it exactly for them, not trying to expand to like every horizon, not trying to make sure that everybody wants to play our game, but to know that the people that do will want to stay here for a really, really long time. And like, I think that's pretty laudable and I think they've done a good job of that. I think they made a few stumbles along the way, but I think they worked really hard to correct any mistakes that they've made when that's happened but no you're right these aren't world of warcraft style mmos and that's what's being asked about so i mean i'm sort of surprised to hear that that many of them are still a thing i mean it's not something that i paid attention to for a long time so i don't know what what are your guys opinions what what do you know at all in fact about that universe well what i know for fact is that there was a time in my life where you know I was uh, I was just embarking on college and I was playing a lot of uh, Baldur's Gate and I took one look at World of Warcraft and I said, that, that there is the end of my life. I think I had exactly the same experience. And I wanted it, but I denied myself it, right? And like for me, that was the moment where I guess for me it was kind of, um, it was kind of broken, right? Like I played a little bit of a uh, Ragnarok online with some friends and realized that if that was compelling, you know, this 2D stupid chat to people, fight some little slimes or whatever. If, if I found that addictive, that the 3D world of World of Warcraft was just going to be too fucking much for me to deal with. That didn't stop me from being interested though. And I did pick up Guild Wars when it came out and I played a lot of that and I had a lot of fun with Guild Wars, but Guild Wars really streamlined that experience. And for me, as someone who hasn't got all the time, like I appreciate that. Like I don't really want to go like on those fetch quests to pick the daisies or whatever. Like I don't want to do that. Like I, I want to get straight to the meat and Guild Wars did a really good way, uh, a really good kind of through line of kind of hitting those marks. And I'm sure that there are others that have done it. I've heard um, the Old Republic has done quite a lot of work in streamlining its experience and like, you know, front loading the, the kind of narrative content and things like that. And I think that that's always been a really good, a good way to approach it. But at the same time, you've got to really have an investment IP. I feel these days to walk up on that kind of market and go, you want, you already want it to live in this world. Yeah. And now we're going to sell you that experience. It's not like, you you know, that new IP like struggles, you know, and there's lots of stuff that sounds really interesting, like the secret world, 
Like that sounded really good. Like that kind of um, oh, myth think... and folklore collapsing over itself in this kind of realistic sim. Like that sounded that sounded so great. If, if we're talking about that time though, like the the one that came out, the the two that came out the same similar times were like the the World of War, uh, uh, the World of Warhammer version of this. And uh, the Conan one as well. Can't remember what it was called. Yeah, like Conan can cash in on that though. Like I'm just, I'm just saying, we all like Conan, right? We we like Co- I, Conan. Yeah, but you know, you know, <laughs> the the idea of like a well crafted like fantasy RPG, like straight up single player RPG in a Conan esque like fantasy universe is. I mean, has it's, anyone actually fucking done it? I don't know. It sounds like, like Skyrim's kind of the closest right, thing as far as I can think I don't know. Of. The preposition sounds a little bit about creating an MMO, which is about an island completely and absolutely inhabited by the Incredible Hulk over and over and over again. The Isle of Hulks, where they just run around and, and punch each, each other in other. the face. Like, like, that's the thing. Like, I think, because, like, Conan's... Is that, is that, like, one of those Japanese islands, the one that has all of the cats? <laughs> There's the, the one, one with the bunny rabbits, the rabbit. one with the cats, and the one with all the Hulks. <laughs> They're just like, like ostracized from Japan. They're like, <laughs> you're too hulky. Go. Yeah, they're all just, you know, from a distance, you can get a boat out and you can get the binoculars out and you can see him doing that mega jump. You know, <laughs> one where they're... Poof. Yeah. You could, you could just hear it in the distance. <sighs> you see the tree shake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Loads I, of money go on that cruise. <laughs> I, I think something you said there, Joe, like definitely is like the one thing that kind of entice me generally like they don't really appeal to me because it's that investment and it just seems impossible like something that is uncompletable is like not not that appealing to me but known property wise like then final fantasy 14 online definitely i see it every so often and it appeals to me and like it keeps doing the um final fantasy fan like hook and it's like, oh, you know, you love the gold saucer from Final Fantasy VII. Well, we've got it with like a ton of new mini games. It's like, oh, you like Triple Triad? That's like a full mini game like system throughout this whole thing. There's like, there's like tournaments going on, and um, I think it's those kind of things and like you know fighting like iconic bosses and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's just that commitment for me. Like, it just doesn't appeal to me. It's like it's too it's too big of a hill to climb. And yeah. it's definitely died off like rapidly, and I think that's to do with the service games. Like, like so much of that sensibility now doesn't exist in the MMO space. It exists in things like um, GTA Online. No, you're like right. That. You're right. Um, there's loads of really successful ones that aren't like that big. I mean, like how many people are playing fucking? You know, we've got your Fortnites or whatever, but also at the same time, how many people are playing fucking Warframe? Like loads, yeah. like it's yeah. who it's super popular. So a couple of things here. So f- first of all, the closest that I ever came to falling into the MMO hole was was actually Final Fantasy XI somehow. Bloody um, hell, how is that a like thing for you? The, I just <laughs> happened to be playing video games with the right people at that time. Um, and like, and I, I, I played a shitload of ten. Like I had ten. Like that is that is the only Final Fantasy that I've done, right? And um when it came down to it, a lot of my online video gaming friends were picking up Final Fantasy XI. So I did. Unfortunately, I was saved by my computer being too shit. <laughs> so that particular addiction never took hold. Um, but um, in terms of like the new kind of games as a service thing, yeah, like the, I guess the the free to play universe of video games that exists of games like uh, Warframe and Fortnite means that people that, want to play video games for the sake of existing as part of a online community as well as having that game have different ways of having that now for less money um yeah. and considering that most of the people that have that time are people that are of the age that we were when we were tempted to play these games or did actually play guild wars like those people have a shitload less money and therefore game for free is so so much more appealing and easy yeah. to like become a part of than anything else so yeah, definitely we, i think we've successfully explained why mmos uh like why those warcraft style mmos are way less of a thing <laughs> maybe not why they do actually still exist at all though yeah but that's the thing because i feel like there is always going to be that desire right there's always there is always going to be somebody who has grown up wishing that they were part of something bigger than they were that is within the archetypes of the fiction or whatever that they're reading or the films that they're watching. And, Mm. you know, 
like we talk about these kind of free to play models, they don't act, they're not, they're not so, they're not so deep. Yeah. They haven't got that cohesion that I think is really important when it comes to those. That's, that's why, you know, I think like Warcraft is just going to go on, you know, like I there's always going to be new people to get whether or not it lessens or, you know, like, the, like, or wanes. But I think there's always going to be these people that, you know, you know, that want to, that on, I don't know, it's difficult to say. So, you know, talking in, you know, kind of like real terms, you know, you have those people that they're like, they lop, you know, they live action role play. They go out into the middle of the field, they save up all their money and they go to a big event where they spend loads of money on their costume, loads of money on the event itself to pre pretend to be somebody else. Now, the investment of cash to be someone who plays Warcraft to uh, do a similar thing you know, that's always going to be a temptation. That's always going to be there, I think. You know, that just wanting to completely immerse yourself into really? something like that. that That's a real big human drive. To ascend from meat space. Well, yeah. <laughs> Although having said that, like, you know, people who do live action role playing, they're enhancing their meat ability. I think, <laughs> right? I think that's something that they're doing. They're massaging I, I, it. They're tenderizing themselves. I don't, I don't know. I've, You'd I've, eat a LARPA, I swear down. <laughs> I think I think one of the exceptions to that um, is is um is like Warframe because I think Warframe started off low key low barrier to entry like bare boned but then they've built that law into it so from what I hear like you know it's they've been afforded that time to actually weave that tapestry they didn't they didn't go in with it but they've because there's that ongoing support, they've had the chance to develop it over time. Uh, the, the, well, the kind of question that I pose to that is like, do you, because I see Warframe much more like I see something more contemporary, like uh, Destiny, for example, right? Yeah, I think like, that's fair. I think, and, and like, I think that that, I think that even Warframe and Destiny, one of the things that they actually miss the Warcraft and uh, Final Fantasy 11 and 14 really like grabbed hold of is that like full submersion, you know, like right. it's that kind of, you know, it's like persistent all the time. There's always people, you might not know them. I always feel that Destiny and Warframe always boiled them down, themselves down into much more instance based yeah, stuff. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and like, I don't think that that actually holds the like conditional human allure of the idea of actually walking into the middle of a field. Yeah, yeah true. when you yeah. just loaded up the game. Yeah, S like having a really difficult time fighting a goblin, and then spinning the camera around and watching a bunch of characters that are higher level than you clapping. Because they, because, you know, they set their characters to do that. And like, I think that that particular, that, I think that's the magic. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that keeps it, that keeps it driving forward is everyone wants to feel that. Right? Question mark. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just the barrier to entry for me. Like, like as a kid, it was always the subscription and it was the subscription and just that and now and now it's the time investment so like you've it, got the whereas money the barrier the time. to entry for these barrier to entry to these other things is so much lower that you, that for, for mass appeal i think that's that's where the market's going you've always either got the money or the time so mm -hmm. that kind of brings us in a roundabout way to our next question because microsoft's been doing something interesting lately which is that they have sort of made their games a lot cheaper by a sort of roundabout route. So let, let me read this one out. So this is from Wabbit. Um, I recently got back into Xbox again after a while of neglect and picked up um, Xbox Game Pass and I wanted to play a new SOD, which it stands for State of Decay. Um, I can't believe that I can access the two latest games by Microsoft, which is Sea of Thieves and State of Decay, with no restrictions, unlike EA Access. Um, at the uh, at the second the um, they come out as part of a seven pound membership, so that's seven pounds a month, and also play them across platform. But that's an issue for a different day. Um, what are your thoughts on this style of subscription model? Do people really care anymore if 
uh, if they don't own a game outright. It's definitely created a wider player base for games like Sea of Thieves, where people uh, were a bit unsure about committing to a full, uh, to, to the full retail purchase price. Would a, subscri- a subscription model um, to a major publisher like uh, Ubisoft or EA, etc., make more people try out different games? And the last little bit, I know Microsoft first floated this idea pre Xbox One. It started with a DR- uh, it started a DRM crusade. Have times changed? Um, so, regarding that last point, I don't think that was exactly what they were suggesting with um, the kind of always online model for the Xbox One. It was more about the fact that you would just be able to purchase and own things in digital form, not that you would be subscribing to um, own various uh, different games on a constant basis. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's actually where the DRM problem came from. Um, But I think the rest of this question is actually really, really interesting. So your thoughts, Dan? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, really cool what Microsoft are doing. Um, I think it's like probably the most bold business move that's happened in the industry for ages. But the cynicist in me is like um, the two games quoted there. And obviously they have said like their future Gears of War games and Halo games will also be on the service. And they have a bunch of third party games on there and even going back to like original Xbox and Xbox 360 games. So there's huge worth in it. But like their current single party lineup is like where you know seemed like huge news when they announced it and it is it like it's not you know you can't really understate the value for money that is but then the quality of these two that have dropped in particular is definitely under question um i know somebody who like got really really into sea of thieves and played it for ages and even he is now like has completely fallen off it and like but for um, seven pounds a month oh like, yeah even exactly. if it's like, not you can't it's it you know what would you have to do? Pay like five months in for the for the price of that one game, something like that. Five more, mm-hmm. six six months worth of Xbox One, and you get it for you get that and countless other games for for six months. It's ridiculous, really. I like it. The economics seem really, really bonkers. They must be taking. I mean, I it's got it's got to be the fact that they're realizing that they're like m- massively being outplayed this generation and that the value that what they actually have to offer at this point isn't worth as much as just having yeah. a different console and all, and the possibility of all of the games that might be played on there i mean like the new state of decay um has reviewed well but not amazingly like apparently it's still incredibly buggy like the first one um and yeah like sea of thieves kind of i mean it kind of got sevens didn't it so yeah i mean you know it seems like a really really solid base for them but it requires a lot more content by the sounds of it yeah but that's the Um, difficulty with microsoft right i mean we're already watching like uh crackdowns been pushed back another year and i kind of like look at that i look at that lineup and i think to myself i mean if you have game pass i like play recall (laughs) <laughs> like you can do it like but I look at that lineup and I mean I look at my own collection of Xbox One exclusives and I, I don't want to play any of them no me neither you know like I've got a lot like you know I've got a lot of games to play and like you know I was pretty and I and when I got it I did I did the big spread I got as many as I had like including things like Sunset Overdrive I'm like I'm not plus really with any mm. of it like the only thing I've really liked is Recall and I found and like Quantum Break is okay, but like I can't recommend that anywhere near as much as I would readily recommend any other Remedy games. You yeah. know, so it's very it, like it's, it's very the curse of it having so, Quantum in the name. Anything yeah. with Quantum in the name is going to be sort of mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, I think that raises an interesting point with Game Pass in particular, though, because it's I think its real strength comes in its back catalogue and its breadth of content. Like it's it's sheer like spread of the different games you can play, especially if you, you know, weren't into like last gen that much. I think you can pick up quite a few. Um, and I think that highlights a problem with the second part of this question where they're saying, suggesting this subscription model like EA access, but for other publishers, I don't think, I don't think single publishers have the catalog to support it. I think it really needs to be a, a, a platform you know, thing. A, a com- yeah. Like a platform thing where you have multiple publishers and, so, 
I think, oh, but, but the suggestion here is, um, I think, not based or aimed at consoles, but that the, 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 the big publishers could do this on PC. Um, I mean, maybe they could and uh, on consoles at a, a more sensible price than, I actually can't remember what it is, the EA charge for EA access, um, but it, it is steeper than I think most people are happy with. But yeah. if, it, if it was an offer that existed across platforms, and it was all of the games being um, uh, sold by a big publisher. I think it might have a li- bit more appeal. But I mean, like Nintendo are about to embark on doing something a little bit similar, but it looks like they're kind of ballsing it up, you know, like throwing out like, you know, four NES games or whatever for you to be able to play because you bought their online subscription. Like, it's just not enough. But I mean, but then we're talking about the model that's existed for Sony for a while, which is not that they're offering like their ex- uh, their first party games as a part of it, but that they find a selection of games on a monthly basis that they think will justify the price of a yearly subscription to PlayStation Plus. Mm. And the same exists for uh, Xbox Live Gold as well. It's not the cream of the crop the same way that like what Microsoft's doing now is supposed to be even if it mm. isn't exactly because they're not producing the first the cream of their the crop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the cream of their crop. Um, the, it's a bad crop. Which is having a bad year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the fat Pestilence. that floats at the top, yeah. Um, but, I mean, may, maybe... I, it, it, all, it feels a lot like what's going on with Microsoft at the moment is that they are really trying to work out how to gain ground on everyone else. And that means that they are coming up with interesting ideas to offer things that have worth that the other console makers are not doing and that's kind of tricky because the both the other console get, uh, makers are offering a lot of value for your money at the moment but i think hopefully what this is really a part of is them trying to invest more into first party video games and actually producing something that's good um, there that's kind of my point because i was fearing that i'd veer a little bit off topic by saying this but like really i feel like it's one of those things where you have this great idea but really you can't build anything unless you have the games like you have to have the games that people want to play it doesn't matter how you deliver them to me if you've got them you know if you build it they will come yeah and i think that that's something that microsoft really need to put some effort into i know that there's rumours and big bubblings about them doing this big push at E3 but I don't think a year delay on Crackdown and Halo 6 is going to patch this sinking ship I I mean I think I can't remember if I've said this on podcast before but I think there's like a brand problem in terms of what Microsoft is tr- has has managed to be successful at in video games before because what what makes Nintendo popular is that they make incredibly tuned like gameplay focused video game experiences that are joyful and that anyone can play right like that's yeah. what they've been about since day and like on the Sony side now we get these like massive big bug big budget like triple a single player narrative experiences like no one else it's like, the cinematic experience and, and it is a risk mm. that none, none of the publishers are willing to make because it doesn't involve playing a game forever it involves investing a lot of money into making a experience that is hopefully quite affecting um and deep right and then microsoft they managed to become a thing because they were like we have multiplayer infrastructure we make multiplayer games that you can play with your friends on our service and actually all of the publishers are doing that now like call of duty became the next big thing after halo that means that like from that point onwards multiplayer video gaming was sort of not in microsoft's hands and they've been trying to hang on to like those few remnants of that making sure that they keep making halos and gears of war until nobody fucking wants to play them anymore but that's- and that means that they don't have like their their kind of like hallmark that makes them special but that's the difficulty though also because i mean like you know you know we talked about it so much recently but like you look at the new you know god of war like that isn't the next god of war it's a new thing that's built around the new ideas if you take gears of gears of war 4 this is fucking gears of war again i couldn't even mm. i couldn't even be bothered to play gears yeah. of war 3 yeah the, it's not very good the, 
That's the best <laughs> of them. They're not very good. I I definitely think like all that is like a problem, but like I'm not sure this move is. I don't think I don't think it necessarily is trying to say that we are committing to our first party. Um, I think it's. I think Microsoft seems to at the minute be pushing for a. We have a really solid service base, and we support everyone. So like recently they announced this. Uh, this like 16 part combination accessibility controller that they are now oh, yeah that the thing console. that thing's amazing yeah yeah, yeah yeah um with like different buttons and like you know sticks and like a huge different combination of things that you so, can use to I mean, play like, the games th- one of the really wonderful things about that so it's got like so it's so it's all about making sure that people can play video games who might not have like the dexterity and all of the digits that mo- that most of us are lucky enough to have so it's two very large buttons and if and Uh, and a few other bits and pieces on it um, that just means that it's easier to hit some extra buttons in a different way. And then what they've got is... I think the kit is like 16 pieces large. Like you can have, I think there's like blowing things and stuff. Like it's a really... Fair enough. Uh, like, I, I mean, like, that that's the part that I saw. But no, you're probably right. There's probably a lot more to it. But the really nice thing is mm-hmm. that, that it has lots of places you can plug extra things in so that it can read, yeah, so that it can read different things as inputs. So it's incredibly mm-hmm. customizable and it makes, yeah, playing games a hell of a lot more accessible. So really kudos to them for that. Like that's, yeah. Like I saw, I saw the video for it, and I was like, "This is obviously like marketing talk," but actually, it just makes me mm. really happy that they've tried to do this anyway. And I sort of don't care that yeah. it's marketing talk because they did good. And I, yeah, and I think that's what they're trying to do. Like I, like not to say not to undermine like the quality of that kind of effort that they've done, but like I think what they're trying to do is like gain goodwill because they lost so much goodwill at the start mm. of this generation. I think they're really trying to push to be the good guys. Like you know, you have. You know, like they're opening their platform up. So they've got like Minecraft on Switch and they are cross platform. You know, Minecraft is now cross platform on everything but Sony because Sony are the ones that are blocking you off. And it's not us. We're open to everything. Like Phil Spencer's on Twitter saying, Yeah, I'm happy for Banjo Kazooie to be in the new Smash Brothers. He's like, Let's talk about it. Um, And I think they're just really trying to like become, I think they are, they have their eyes beyond the consoles so i think they they see themselves in in years where they'd be a service and everyone will come to their service because they they have the they have the best and most uh inviting service i think this is sort of i mean like this this talks to exactly the age that i am i think this is exactly what we saw happening in on the last generation in reverse i think it was that um Mark, uh, sony had the hubris they stepped forward they were like everyone loves us so we can just do what we want and microsoft were like well no like we we know how to deal with this like where we're, we're going to push forward and every and everybody's actually going to come in our direction because we are not assuming that we're putting the effort in and this time microsoft stepped forward with the with that same hubris and everybody's gone to the sony console and now microsoft is trying to make up ground mm. the same way sony successfully did last right, generation so microsoft made a misstep before they even got to that they stepped out I guess to regroup or whatever and didn't release any games in that like 18 month period where some of the best PlayStation free mm-hmm. games came out like with the PS2 yeah. like you know Sony still ran that into the ground so the goodwill was there to have I would say mm-hmm. that that rather than cashing or in all their kind of goodwill they started this with none <laughs> Because of that poor mistake, no one wants in that eighteen month period. No one wanted to play a remake of the first Fable, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Whilst everyone else is playing fucking Last of Us, yeah, yeah. Like that, it it they dropped the fucking ball hard. No, and they, right. Obviously, then they led with the microtransactions and the DRM shit, mm. created a shitstorm for them. But 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 I mean, but I mean, PlayStation Three people will get a second job to buy this console. Like it's it it is it, it feels like it feels like there is a certain kind of expectation that the that the console developers have that they re- they really need to realise and hope hopefully after like these two massive fucking clusterfucks they're going to realise actually they need to just make sure that they're giving people what they want. I have a question that's kind of like in my head that's kind of like the logical step. Do you guys think they've got it, got what it takes? Because I am worried that right now Microsoft are existing in a very much a kitchen sink for any idea is a good fucking idea kind of mentality. 
that I'm worried might be difficult for them. I think that actually what they need to do and hopefully what they are doing is investing in some first party development that they are working out how to foster the same kind of group of core studios that we see working for Sony and working for Nintendo making excellent Mm -hmm. games time and time again that if they are doing that and I think I think this takes a while for it to like come to fruition but hopefully the the kind of structures of Microsoft won't prohibit that now, that that it's recognised that there's so much money to be made in video games that they have to be a part of it in some fashion. The only way to do that successfully is to let it take time. And I think mm-hmm. that we probably won't see that coming to any sort of proper fruition for, I don't know, another two or three years, but that it's in mm. the works. When the next Perfect think- Dark comes up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what if- happens to the below. It's still coming. Like I think, I think it's been doing the rounds a bit. You on about the uh, the like sword and sorcery guys game? Yeah, yeah, the sword yeah, and sorcery exactly. roguelike. Yeah, I feel like we might see more of that E three or maybe. It's, it's I think, been, I think it's, it's been a bit of time now. I've heard rumor it's out this year. Like I've heard like mem- like Where's stuff people talking you know, about it this year. That one that you guys were talking about what was it called the last night. I mean, yeah. that's, that's Where did, like... Where's that, though? That's, that's still on its way. I was expecting to yeah. have that by Mate, this juncture. That, like, we, was, we saw, like, the, last year. Yeah, and we saw the like the smallest amount of anything for it. Like, it's... Yeah, like yeah. one frame. You got there, me so yeah. gassed. I love me a bit of flashback. <laughs> mm. um, just quick, quickly on the Microsoft thing. I think um, I think the, uh, the cool thing they have, though, is if they manage to pull that first party thing off and they have this kind of service where you can get their first party games this will become like a must have and if they can have like you know you know the netflix of games like if you can make your service essential like Fucking like netflix, netflix feels now, like Fucking feels netflix, at times though. no uh, right sorry <laughs> i i should actually explain what i mean here because because what what you're saying makes sense and yeah. like i'm sure could be incredibly successful but <sighs> The, there's a, there's a thing that really annoys me about what's happened with Netflix <laughs> is that they've gone from thinking that what they need to produce is good quality content f- that people want to view to thinking that actually mm-hmm. their aim is to keep people on Netflix as much as possible and that mm-hmm. instead of trying to make things that are good they're trying to make things that people will watch all of the time and that actually makes the value of Netflix much much lower and that means that the time that I spend there is much less well spent and that makes yeah. it less valuable to me and yeah, it's, it, it is, the- I think it's really interesting that you say that about this move from Microsoft because I feel like the move that has been happening in terms of games as a service is doing exactly that it's going we want yeah. you to play our game all of the time not that we want you to have a really good experience playing our game mm. and and both those games that we're talking about are both you know games of games as a service both sea of thieves and saved gay um yeah i think that's true about netflix they're almost like saturating their own market because because they still do the they still do like high quality stuff but they you know it's hard to find netflix, now. I, I, don't, do I don't know what the, the new stuff Sorry, I didn't hear you, Dan. I talked over you. No, I'm just saying, yeah, like the the ratio of good Netflix to bad Netflix is mm-hmm. is I, uh, askew. <laughs> I can't actually find the good new stuff because everything that's recommended to me is not good, or most Did of you, what is. So, I, I, two quick recommendations then. I think it's a Netflix original, The Keepers, which is a documentary series about like a nun that goes missing in like the 80s or something in Boston. Second one. Uh, it was out last year, American Vandal, which is like a spoof version oh my God, of that's a so crime good. documentary, and it's I, genius. Yeah, oh God. I, I know, I know about that. Oh, I still so, haven't watched it's it so, though. It's so good. I didn't know how to take the first episode, but I'm so glad that I powered through American Vandal oh, yeah. because it is the meta end of like culture. <laughs> okay, I, I I clearly need to get back on that. The one the it one is. that's been the best lately though has been Dear White People. Like that's just solidly excellent in its second season and I do recommend that to you. So there are still clearly good things on there. They're just a bit harder to find. But yeah. when we are on the hunt for good new shit, sometimes it's nice to wind back in a different direction to go to classics from the past that have a little bit more maturity and have aged like a fine wine so dan tell us about resi 2 i hear you've been playing it yeah the gift that keeps on giving is my commute well it's all it's a burden and a and a, <laughs> and a blessing but it means i can play games for like two hours a day so the burden that lets you play games 
Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I started playing Resi 2 about, I don't know, like last last Monday. And I've I've almost finished it twice now. I've done like one and almost a full other playthrough. Um, prior to this, I played, in the order I've played Resi's is like four, five, remake seven, and then two. So it's a really kind of shotgun approach to playing Resi games. Um, but it like seriously holds up. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's really refreshing for me to having, I'm really glad I had played remake before it and, you know, it's not quite the original Resident Evil, but it's close enough, um, in order to appreciate the evolution that happens in two. Um, and you can kind of see, I, it kind of gives me an appreciation of the trajectory the whole series has taken, like the, the increase in the number of zombies that you encounter and the kind of threat that they pose like suddenly feels like drastically higher from the off like the first scene you're like surrounded by five zombies and it's like oh my god what do i do because like in resi one like i was one of those i was one of those idiots who just like shot everything like and used up all my ammo and like never ran past anything and it would have been really easy thinking back to resi one but like as soon as i get into resi two it's like you've got to run because you have nowhere near enough bullets to deal with any of this so i'm gonna i'm gonna put something out there at this point in time which may seem strange but there might be people listening to this podcast who were not actually familiar with what Resident Evil 2 was when yeah, it was Resident okay. Evil 2. So, so let's give us a little rundown. So classic Resident Evil is fixed camera angles. You are a uh, police op- operative of sorts. You have you have a uh, you have uh, selected weapons. It's like the birth of survival horror, I suppose, in a lot of ways. You have to navigate around a sort of puzzle box environment is how I, how it seemed, how it, how like I've been thinking about it, where you, you have a starting point, you have certain areas you can go to certain areas you can't, but definitely multiple routes you could go. And then as you go through, you get different items. Those different items can give you access to other areas. And then maybe you'll get items there that'll allow you to go back where you were before. And slowly you unfold this, like this very intricately designed this level and the level design of these games is amazing and just you slowly unfurl all this stuff and as you're unfurling the the environment you're also unfurling the narrative and finding these like notes and you know reading up uh, about what has happened here because you're dealing with the threat of like zombies uh you know they're everywhere and so you have like very limited ammo it's tank controls so you have to like push forward and backwards to move forward and backwards and then left and right to turn left and right so it's it's kind of awkward to control, but it you know it yeah, definitely kind of feeds into that like traumatic moments, like where you're stuck in a corner and you're like, oh my god, I'm gonna get past these zombies, but like I'm like a clumsy mess trying to run past them. Um, so yeah, and then the idea is you know you've got to go around this environment, get your only way through, find your way through, and like get out, get escape from it essentially, and you know find the truth of what's been going on. Does that sound like a good summary? <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a good description of it. Um, I think for me, like like it's such an important video game. Mm. You know, uh, I was like writing exactly the the catchment for it when it came out, which is like too young to be able to buy it in the shop. You know, because yeah. it had that like legit fifteen written on it. But Resident <laughs> Evil is. Um, you know, it's kind of ubiquitous in the video game sphere now. And it's, uh, you know, it's part of that zombie genre fiction. But I think one of the things that's really important that people don't talk about so much about Resident Evil is actually Resident Evil is why zombies came back. Hmm. Yeah, those ideas that people had, you place those Resident Evil games and there's that five, in five years, you got 28 days later. And then fucking mm-hmm. zombies is back. And you, you watch know, 28 was, days I was, later. I was going to say to you that surely the thing that brought them back was 28 days later. Yeah, but actually, nah, no, the thing Resident that made 20... Re- we know that Alex Garland played a fuck of a lot of video yeah. games. So the, yeah, that's yeah. fucking fair. So, and like, that's that's the that's the flashpoint. They brought them back. And the really amazing thing about it is they have so many trappings of those um, George A. Romero movies. Like, like you know, musically... They take mm. keys from that. They've got this very bizarre, like, dread synths 
Yeah, like yeah. with a bit of piano thrown over the top. And, you yeah. know, like now when I think about Resident Evil, the first piece of music that comes into my head every time is the savour music from Resident yeah. Evil 2. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. just this simple piano. Boom, ba-dum, 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 it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of, but it's, it's a lot sadder than that. Like it's, it's more melancholic. Yes, because I don't it, have it, the under synth, Dan. Yeah, I don't yeah, have okay, the, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I can't do it all at once, mate. I'm mm. not a one man band, unfortunately, but <laughs> like, but the things about, so, I mean, really you have to kind of look at like Resident Evil, like one to really yep. kind of see it in its like context. Resident Evil one was, um, like a kind of, I always see it as like a finished thought. Like before Resident Evil 1, there was this little game, um, I was a little game in a big franchise, Alone in the Dark. Oh, man. Right? So like Alone in the Dark kind of started this kind of way of dealing with a kind of adventure game if it was also a bit of horror. Do you know, Alone like, in the Dark had a bad end. Yeah. And so, yeah, it really did. <laughs> but, um, and like kind of Resident Evil kind of really built upon that. That idea of like puzzles um, and jump scares and horror elements could all be thrown together into this kind of like bigger conspiracy narrative, you yeah. know, with voice acting and things like that, which had never been available at mm. the time, like until that point. And yeah. Resident Evil 2, like it, I mean, we t- like when we talk about modern games, right? Resident Evil 1 in many ways is uncharted. <laughs> And Resident Evil 2 is very much the Uncharted 2. It's the bit where all of those ideas come together and they fire on, you know, all cylinders at once. Mm. Like it's re- like this, the scope of the game is ridiculous. Mm. You know, like they'll, like in the first yeah. game, you open a door, there'll be like, a, you know, a zombie in a room and you'll go through it over and over and over again and nothing will change. Mm-hmm. Like Resident Evil 2's environments will change with you. So, for example, you can be yeah. going through the police station, big key key area. I'd say it was the first main area of the game. You go through there over and over and over again. There's a section where a helicopter smashes into the police station. Mm. That also lets a new influx of zombies into the building. Because yeah. obviously it does. It smashed the massive fucking hole in the wall. Like, so, I mean... It's- because that that kind of evolution of a space in a video game is is something that is is sort of like archetypical of like a particular kind of collection like if if you were to define uh, define genres instead of by how you shot things but actually like the spaces that games existed in that could be a genre like um the the first of the new tomb raiders is like so incredibly about that and it feels great because of it is is this the first time that Mm. happened i would say it's further ahead on that particular idea of like um cinematic cause and effect than things like the tomb raiders were at the time Mm. right like um and the way that like certain bits of the environment will get locked off to you depending on stuff that's happening and those feels very dynamic yeah um there are certain things that it will really like throw you for a loop. And the way the kind of really genius thing it has is it's got these, this concept of two playthroughs and depending on who, which character you pick first, you then have to play through the second time as a different character. And both those playthroughs will be different and they'll be different if you swap the order in which you play them. Um, But the genius thing it does there is it like builds off your preconceptions of what you've done in that first one. And in the first one, you'll encounter things that you don't know why that part of the 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 environment is like that so like the helicopter for example on my first playthrough i just encountered the helicopter whereas at the start of my second playthrough i saw the helicopter crash um and so it really like layers on top of itself this this concept of learning the environment and and actually it being, it being a single single existing environment yeah so yeah because if you if you end up with those as as lots of video games quite cleverly do when video games are at their best there's a lot of environmental storytelling that goes on where you're left to piece together what's actually happened to create the situation that you observe and if you actually get to see bits of that along the way Mm. a second time after you've assumed something you can find out whether you're right or wrong and that's going to allow you to build further on that that's that's a really really good idea and not and actually not one that i can think of having seen in games that i've played like the the second viewing giving you a 
a additional angle on putting it all together. I think actually a game that's come out pretty recently that is supposed to do that very well, but I haven't played is Near Automata, um, yeah. which does that with something like nine playthroughs. Um, yeah, but something. It's nice to know that yeah. those those ideas are still being run with. But the interesting thing is, is actually you can start the game as either of the characters. So yeah. each character, so it's Leon and Claire, and you have a Leon A and a Leon B scenario and a Claire A and a Claire B scenario. And at the mm-hmm. beginning, depending on whose disc you put in the PlayStation first, you will be playing their scenario, which will unlock the subsequent scenario for the other player. Mm-hmm. Right. So you you end up crafting your experience kind of exactly how you want it. I believe Canon is weirdly Claire A and Leon B, I think. Oh, I'm doing non-canon then. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, which, you know, like when I was growing up, I was always assumed it was because he's just on, he's the first disc that you get. I always assumed <laughs> it was Leon. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Resident Evil in its, let's be honest, less good convoluted days has created those outcomes to be relatively difficult, but they are also testing a bunch of really key gameplay mechanics here as well. Like, uh, in the, in the B scenarios, there is a kind of semi permanent antagonist character. Yeah. Who is, um, who back in the day, me and mine, we effectively affectionately named him George. I believe Canon, he's Tyrant 2.0 or Mr. X. Yeah, he's but I, you know, scary. like I don't, I, 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 he's kind of the proto nemesis, you know, and yeah. I don't, obviously people, people might not be familiar with that, but that idea of a character that permanently stalks you, you yeah, know, I mean, like modern, modern examples are the alien in Alien or, yeah, you know, or the, the bakers in Resident Evil 7. <sighs> That um, this kind of yeah. ever present threat. Wait, so what? I mean, I I haven't played Rosie Two. I I have no idea here. So so, what form does does George take? And George is this ma- giant man in a trench coat that ends up getting dropped out of a helicopter into the police station in sort of some sort of a like, tube. Pod. Yeah, mm. that ends up expanding, and he comes out. He um, and he marches towards you with with an intent. Yeah, yeah. You can like you kind of either fight him or run away. But he'll turn up at multiple times throughout the uh, throughout the game, and you'll do battle mm. with him in the B scenario. Later on, this would be expanded in Resident Evil Three to Nemesis, who I believe Staunchy is one of like the greatest gifts that Resident Evil has given to video games. Like you know, the concept that this is a thing that can be done, which is an enemy that kind of perma stalks you like through different mm. areas, like Nemesis, like. Um, I don't think Mr. X follows you through like doors. No, like I always just run for the nearest yeah, door. Yeah, <laughs> you run for the nearest door, you go through it and then he's gone. Yeah, yeah. but uh, Nemesis will follow you through them. Yeah, I no, don't think like- I could hack that. Like I really struggle. Like the first opening scene in Resi 7, like where like Jack is like just wandering around, like I almost like couldn't hack that. So like I'm not I sure I could hack this Nemesis. Yeah. He like cut my arm off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I was all like, no. Up. I mean, like Nemesis, uh, like I think that Nemesis is like its, it's big thing is that it does build that up to a great crescendo. Like really you're fighting mm. Nemesis. There are other bosses and stuff, but you know, like he's what you remember from it. Like mm. I think Resident Evil 3 is weaker in a lot of other ways, but that particular aspect of it is, is phenomenal. It's interesting you said bosses actually, because I think that's one way that two is different but it's actually possibly a strong point like it has less bosses uh, and less obvious bosses like whereas like resi one has like a snake and stuff um resi two feels more contextualized than one i would say so like its environment is try to it's you know it's a bit gamey in some ways but it's less gamey than resi one it's it's a bit more committed to its to its uh it's it's context in within its own narrative, and, and I, think, I think that's a, I think it's a strong point for it. No, absolutely. Like, and it's got a lot of persistent bosses. Like, uh, one of the bosses, uh, William Birkin, lab scientist, mm. gone gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, is of like you fight him in various stages of his mutation as you go along. Like you watch him kind of mm. degenerate as the game as the game progresses which is really good and like that kind of sense of progression is something that um 
you know, was really starting to happen in like the PlayStation One. Like it's something that uh, Metal Gear Solid did really well. You know, those kind of tiered bosses that you'll fight throughout. Like, I always remember the, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. you know, Liquid, you know, he just won't fucking die, you yeah, know, yeah. And, it, and like, it keeps rolling back. But, I mean, there's other interesting things about Resident Evil 2, like, Resident Evil 2, I always see as um, the beginning of Platinum Games, <laughs> right? weirdly, because, <laughs> um, so, uh, Shinji Makame, he, he uh, directed the uh, first... Resident Evil and he's the uh, founder of Platinum Games um, and uh, as Capcom would like to do they expunge everyone expel <laughs> expel this was successful expel get fresh blood on it and they brought <laughs> a new guy uh, Hideki Kamiya uh, <laughs> of Bayonetta fame and uh, Devil May Cry on to do the sequel something that later would happen exactly to him when someone gave him a phone call and said oh by the way we've just finished devil may cry 2 and he said you're making a devil may cry 2 capcom leaving him to uh, <laughs> split from that company um but um but those two spent a lot of time arguing about the vision of what resident evil 2 would be mm. And an argument that affectionately continues through to this day whilst they try and work out what the fuck they're doing as Platinum Games, <laughs> um, which is a, a battle that they obviously enjoy having. Mm. Um, and so I see it as, as very important when you look at it in that way. Like all of those little bits, it's like the beginning. That Resident Evil 2 is the genesis point of every spoke. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind mm. of through route that goes from Onomusha through to Devil May Cry. And then the other way, the other way that goes through to the uh, other Resident Evils and the bits of it that go towards, you know, opening a door to things like uh, Grasshopper Studios for Killer7 and Beautiful Joe. All of that happens here. Hmm. You know, like and it's, it's a very important historical. Video no, but let's game. let's not forget. I mean, but you you kind of <laughs> talk about like also the fact that that created twenty eight days later created yeah. the new zombies. Like the games that have come off of that have had that influence as well. Like so <laughs> many of the games that you've just mentioned have become classics in their own right. So yeah, like. I should probably have fucking played it. Oh, yeah, so I'm it's not a, going to. Uh, yeah, but I yeah, should have <laughs> fucking tank controls. What are you? Some sort of it, fucking even? Some sort of cretin? It, it does hold up. <laughs> it, like, Dan, it does, Dan like, you're much more forgiving of these things than um, but I didn't play, old I young didn't play buck remake. over here. <laughs> <laughs> old young I buck. Old young buck. That's what I'll call I, you I now. <laughs> Grandpa I, I, young buck. <laughs> I didn't play remake with tank controls because I couldn't be bothered with it. But then this one, I've actually, it, it didn't take that long to pick up. I was really surprised because like I hated them in like Grim Fandango. Like, because I did. They're it fucking a, bad in Grim Fandango. I did Fandango, it because there was though. a bloody trophy for it. And I was like, oh, well, I want the trophy. Oh, you and fucking then, like, sucker. I, I got a platinum though. So <laughs> <laughs> worth it in the end. I still was have. it? Was it, Dan? Was it really? Was it? <laughs> I mean, I just want to say, Dan, I, I have mean, I finished it. I played Grim Fandango and hated every fucking minute of moving his character. <laughs> it was awful, fucking worth mate. it. I, Especially I, when it's so I, hard to pick up items. <laughs> I still haven't ever got a platinum and I still feel like I enjoy video games quite a lot. So, consider yeah. that. Imagine what you could be experiencing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah okay right anyway i think i think because i did want to make this podcast a little bit short so we've still got some energy left to take on the gargantuan behemoth that is uh e3 interesting there's so many ways of pro uh, pronouncing behemoth i wasn't sure which one i'd come out with anyway um mm -hmm. um if you've enjoyed this episode or even if you haven't but you've enjoyed the one before and you think you might enjoy the one after do you recommend this to people uh, to other people you think might be interested um if you want to send us a question you can do so by going to our website tastemygameface.com and then joining the discord um, where we have a questions thread on there or you can send us an email to tastemygameface at gmail.com um, you can also find us on twitter and facebook at tastemygameface and on youtube where hopefully you might even be watching this but who knows um with all that in mind, there's nothing else that I need to mention, is there? I ask this every time now because I'm always One convinced thing. I'll forget. Go on. Resident Evil 2 is a stone fucking classic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so with that and in mind... May be, and there may be a remake coming. Maybe you already know about it in the future, but we don't. So. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> and but, and but the, hopefully there'll be some information about that and we can uh, muse upon and reflect on that mm. at some point in the future. 
in the yeah. near future, no doubt. So with all that in mind, uh, that's episode 77 of Taste My Game Face. I am your host, Azizi Adiemo, and... Um, I'm Joe Knight. I'm Dan Slawson. And we will catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Taste my game fix.